Rabbi Tovia Singer has a great line he likes to use when it comes to New Testament authorship. Luke does not end yours truly, Luke. Um, Matthew doesn't say, and best wishes for a happy new year, Matthew. That's a great way to make his point. Honestly, I find Rabbi Singer to be a masterful communicator. And many people, including Christians, find Rabbi Singer pretty convincing because he speaks with such confidence and, and he knows Hebrew and he knows the New Testament text so well. But it turns out the arguments he uses are quite often problematic and full of holes. His anti-Christian bias is so strong that he often builds his arguments on double standards without seeming to realize it. And this is the case with many of his arguments against the New Testament. And we're going to look at six arguments today, hearing from the rabbi in his own words. But let me offer a disclaimer up front, just to make sure I'm not misunderstood. And please listen carefully because this is important. First, although I disagree with him on many things, I genuinely like Rabbi Singer. He's never been anything but kind to me. And second, I accept the Tanakh the Jewish Bible as the inspired Word of God. It makes up the first 75% of my Bible, and I believe everything it says. So, what I'm not arguing against in this video is Rabbi Singer as a person or the Jewish Bible. What I'm going to be arguing against is the logic, the arguments that Rabbi Singer uses when trying to rise up against Jesus in Christianity. The reason I put out videos like this is to help clear away the confusion and the half-truths that anti-Christian rabbis promote about Jesus in the New Testament. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, the Messiah. Let's look at the rabbi's arguments. Rabbi Singer likes to make a case against the New Testament books that have anonymous or unknown authorship. And in fairness, I've never heard him make a false claim about the authorship of the New Testament books, nor the, the general time when they were written. The statements I've heard fall within the accepted parameters of, of Christian scholarship. But what he does is raise a red flag and insinuate that when the authorship is unknown, the books can't be trusted. Whoever wrote the book of Matthew, Whoever wrote it, we don't know. I know your Bible says St. Matthew, but in reality the manuscripts, the Greek manuscripts, don't say that. We, we cannot say who wrote them, their names, despite what, what you, you're told in church. We cannot tell you where Mark was written. We have no idea. It's important to bear in mind that um, all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are written anonymously. True enough. And there's another book of the Bible that wasn't signed by the author, Genesis. Tradition says it was written by Moses, but that book doesn't even mention his name. Tradition holds that Jeremiah wrote 1st and 2nd Kings, but the books themselves don't confirm that. They aren't signed, best wishes Jeremiah. Tradition says that Samuel wrote the books of Samuel, but the books themselves don't confirm that. And in fact, they record the events of Samuel's death. So if he's the author, he certainly didn't write the whole thing. And here's what's interesting. Because Rabbi Singer wants to undermine the New Testament books of unknown authorship, you'd think he wasn't aware of the, the fact about Samuel. But it turns out he is. It's not because of authorship. Like, who wrote the book of Samuel? We have a tradition about this, but there are whole bunch of authors to it, but that's not why we believe in Samuel. It couldn't all have been written by Samuel because Samuel dies in, in the 25th chapter, okay? So you will not encounter any religious Jew who believes that the book of Samuel is part of our scripture, our sacred history, because of the reliability and authorship of Samuel. No. Okay, so that makes his arguments against the New Testament even more confusing. So it doesn't bother him that we don't know the actual author of Samuel, but when it comes to the New Testament, unknown authorship implies that the books can't be trusted. That's not only a double standard, it's a double standard he's fully aware of using. And as we all know, double standards make for terrible arguments. So if he's aware of the unknown authorship of some of the books in the Jewish Bible, 
Why does he still trust them as true? When Abraham encounters three angels in Genesis 18, why do I believe it? It's just faith. I can't prove it. It's not blind faith. I trust the book. When I trust the book, therefore, if the book is true, if the events are true, I therefore trust what is described in that book. But it's based on faith that I believe that Elijah and Elisha resurrected the dead. I, I can't prove that. Really? He's willing to take the Jewish Bible on faith, despite unknown authorship, yet he casts aspersions on the New Testament because of unknown authorship. This kind of makes me think that all of his arguments about the anonymous authorship in the New Testament are just so much noise. Personally, I accept both the Tanakh and the New Testament as the inspired Word of God. And the human authorship doesn't matter so much to me because the ultimate author of both texts is the God of Israel. An argument that Rabbi Singer often uses to promote the idea that, that the Gospels were not written by who we think they were is when the author refers to themselves in the third person. Here's what he says about the book of Matthew. And then Christians just can't believe that Matthew was actually written by Matthew, although there's nothing in the book of Matthew that would indicate that quite the contrary. Matthew 9.9 9 makes it very clear that the writer was definitely not Matthew, but writing in the third person. Rabbi Singer says that because Matthew 9.9 9 is written in the third person, it very clearly reveals that the book wasn't written by Matthew. And he's right about the third person reference. Matthew 9.9 9 says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he rose and followed him. So the author didn't write, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw me sitting in the tax booth, right? Matthew is referred to in the third person here. And regarding John's gospel, Singer says, The book of John is explicit. The author, whoever wrote it, is explicit that he, he's saying he's not John. You'll find that in John 21, 20, with the writer, whoever he is, is saying that he got this from the disciple whom Jesus loved, which would be John. So he, he's saying, I'm not him, okay? Again, the fact that the alleged author refers to themselves in the third person is enough for Rabbi Singer to conclude that they didn't actually write the text. And here's what's interesting about this line of argument. Rabbi Singer is on the record time and again affirming that Moses wrote the Torah. The Torah was written by Moses, who was inspired by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let me read you a verse from the Torah and, and see if anything jumps out at you. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. That's right, this verse refers to Moses in the third person, which according to Rabbi Singer's logic means that Moses did not write the Torah. In fact, in the Torah, Moses is referred to in the third person over 500 times. So if a third person reference to the author means that person didn't write the text and the books of anonymous authorship can't be trusted, what does Rabbi Singer do with the Torah? This is a glaring double standard. The case he's trying to build against the New Testament cuts against his own scripture. It's like in those cartoons when the person saws off the end of the branch that they're sitting on. Rabbi Singer believes tradition, which says that Moses wrote the Torah. And I'm fine believing that too although the last chapter of the Torah tells us about the death of Moses, so he wasn't likely the only author. But ultimately, our faith isn't placed in the human authorship, but in Scripture's divine author. And all the noise that Rabbi Singer tries to make about the authorship of the New Testament is just a distraction from that fact. In his arguments against the validity of the New Testament, Rabbi Singer also likes to throw in a generous dose of liberal scholarship. He'll bring up early hypothetical documents that are posited as a way to explain the similarities and differences between the various Gospels. For example, he'll bring up a theoretical document called Q, and the whole idea of this Q Gospel is based on the concept that the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are so similar that they must have copied from each other and or another source. Well, this other source is what they call Q. So Matthew and Luke clearly were relying on another source um, for those passages which are uncommon, but whoever wrote Mark did not have access to that source. 
And that source is called the source, it's called Q, which is, stands for the German word for source, Quell. Okay? So that's Q. What we need to remember is that this theory about a Q gospel is just that, a theory. There's no actual evidence for it. No manuscript fragments have been found. No early writings from the church fathers mention anything that could be considered a Q source. This is a product of liberal scholarship and it's promoted by people like Rabbi Singer who don't believe the New Testament is divinely inspired and God breathed. But for Christians, this is a bit of a tempest in a teapot. It's a distraction, a way to make noise and try to cast doubt on the New Testament. For Christians like me, who believe that the New Testament is the inspired word of God, this theory is, in the words of Shakespeare, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. The fact is that both the Old and New Testaments contain some texts of unknown authorship, which were composed in unknown locations and for which we don't have the autographs, meaning the original writings. We have copies of copies. Now this fact doesn't bother Rabbi Singer when it comes to the Old Testament. He only brings it up as an issue with the New Testament. And here's the thing. We can affirm the entire Bible is true and inspired because while we may not know who wrote some of the books, God does, and we don't place our faith in human authors, but in the living God who inspired the sacred text. Nothing could prevent him from communicating his word to his people just the way he wants to. So whenever you hear Rabbi Singer begin to discuss the Q gospel, or a source called L, just recognize that he's headed off into the land of liberal speculation, and you can safely ignore his arguments. Rabbi Singer often questions the New Testament writings because they were written so long after the actual events. And to give you a sense of years, we're talking about many years, in the ancient world, this was a very long time. Uh, if, Jesus, if Jesus was crucified in the year 30, for example, so Mark has written about the year 70, 65, 70, that means that's a very long time. That's That's... 40 years after the crucifixion. Matthew and Luke are writing about 15 years after Mark, and the book of John is written some 15 years, 10 to 15 years after Matthew and Luke. The rabbi only mentions the Gospels in that clip, but actually, the epistles of Paul are the earliest New Testament documents. 1 Thessalonians is typically considered the earliest letter, dated to around the year 50 or 51. And in historical categories, that is considered incredibly early writing. Do you remember where you were on 9-11? When that attack happened 21 years ago, and I can tell you where I was and who was with me when it happened. So we're talking about New Testament documents that were written while eyewitnesses were still alive. So when Paul tells his readers about the hundreds of people who saw Jesus resurrected, he's appealing to a wide public attestation of the resurrection. But let's stick with the Gospels, and let's take Rabbi Singer's timeline at face value. Let's say the book of Mark was written around 40 years after the resurrection. That is still incredibly early. I mean, the earliest manuscripts we have for any of Aristotle's work are dated to a thousand years after he died, which is why even skeptical and non-believing historians will affirm that the New Testament is the best set of attested historical documents in existence. To get a sense of perspective, think about this. How many years elapsed between the Garden of Eden and when Moses wrote about it? Or how about the flood and when Moses wrote about it? Or, or the life of Abraham? We're talking about thousands of years with the Torah as opposed to a couple decades with the New Testament. And Moses didn't personally witness many of the things he wrote about. And yet Rabbi Singer doesn't question whether they're true. He takes it on faith which is that same double standard rearing its ugly head again. If we're going to cast doubt on the accounts of the New Testament based on when it was written, how much more should we doubt the Torah on that same basis? I can't imagine how many hours of video and, and live discussion Rabbi Singer has spent trying to point out alleged differences in the passion narratives. And we need to remember He's not approaching these narratives with an open mind, intending to learn what they have to say. Rather, 
He, he's combing through them like a prosecuting attorney looking to poke holes in an alibi. His arguments include things like mentioning that one particular person is only mentioned by one particular gospel and not the others, or, or that the gospels disagree about details, such as what order events things happened and who was at the empty tomb and so on. Only Matthew and Luke uh, uh, make stake the claim that Jesus was born to a virgin. None of the other gospels um, uh, could think that there's anything unusual about Jesus' conception. I mean, it would, it would be hard to imagine why Mark would, would not think that would be important enough to mention. What happens instead in John chapter 13 is something that you will not find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and that is Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples. I mean, John is noted for these massive discourses that don't exist anywhere in the Synoptic Gospels. The ideal that Rabbi Singer seems to have in mind although he doesn't say it in so many words, is that of four identical Gospels, all mentioning the same people and the same events in the same order. But if we were to edit the Gospels to overcome all of his objections, we would end up with four identical Gospels. And we can already guess what his new line of argument would be. He would then accuse the Gospels of all describing a made-up, pre-established story because of their similarities. Like when police detectives hear identical accounts from four different eyewitnesses, they start to think that they all got together beforehand to get their story straight. The bottom line is that the gospel narratives all agree that Jesus was crucified on a cross by the Romans and his body was put in the grave the same day and early on the first day of the week, his women followers found his tomb empty and the resurrected Jesus then appeared to his apostles and disciples. Now, you can make all the noise you want about the details about the spices for the body or, or which women were at the tomb or, or when the Last Supper was eaten, but the Gospels together give us four different trustworthy perspectives on the same historical event. Rabbi Singer also likes to argue quite a bit about the order of the Gospels. He regularly claims that the early church fathers wanted to get Matthew first because it was so important that people read that first before Mark. And that was very important to church fathers to get Matthew number one. Because if you read Mark first, you would have you know, no nativity, um, narrative, nothing. Birth, virgin birth, Bethlehem, that's gone. So putting Matthew before Mark Mark just becomes a blur and then seems very similar, which it is, to Matthew. And it's sort of what's missing sort of gets people don't notice it. So let's think this through for a minute. Suppose Mark did come first and, and all Christians read through Mark before ever reading through Matthew. And yes, I know this assumes that everyone reads the books of the Bible in their entirety in sequential order. But let's just grant that for the sake of argument for the moment. Suppose we read through Mark and there was no genealogy, no birth narrative, no mention of Bethlehem, and so on. And then when we then get to Matthew and start to read about the genealogy of Jesus and the birth narrative, what does Rabbi Singer suppose a reader's conclusion would be? Would they, would they reject Matthew because it includes details that Mark didn't mention? Of course not. They would think, oh, this is great. I I'm getting more information about the life of this person named Jesus. This is the flip side of the argument about the differences in the Passion narratives. Just like the four Gospels were never intended to be identical documents, they're, not, they're also not intended to be read completely independent of one another. They're more like a, I don't know, like a jazz band. You've got a drummer and a bass player and a guitar player and a singer, right? Four different musicians playing different instruments, each making different musical statements, sometimes harmonizing with one another, sometimes playing in unison, but they're all performing the same song. And in the case of the Gospels, the four writers are all telling the same story. So for my Christian friends who are watching, and, and really for anyone who's watching this video, I hope you can see how Rabbi Singer's arguments against Jesus and against Christianity and the New Testament aren't as strong as they first appear. When we take the time to think them through, they actually have a lot of weak points and holes. 
The arguments we looked at today can, can really be classified into two categories. First is the category of double standards. You know, I accept the, the Hebrew Bible on faith, so does Rabbi Singer. That's great. But many of the reasons he then gives for rejecting the New Testament work equally well against the Jewish scriptures. For example, in both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, some books are of anonymous or unknown authorship. But what, what Rabbi Singer says is that over here in the New Testament, unknown authorship is a problem that Christians need to deal with. But over here in the Tanakh, unknown authorship is no big deal. Take it on faith. And both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament contain text that was written long after the event actually occurred by writers who weren't eyewitnesses. And the problem's much worse with the Hebrew Bible because the time between the events and the writing is a matter of many centuries rather than a few decades. And what Rabbi Singer says is, hey, over here in the New Testament, that's a problem that Christians need to deal with. But over here in the Tanakh, eh, it's no big deal. I take it on faith. And these are double standards that fail to undermine the validity of the New Testament. And secondly, some of his argumentation could be put in a category called noise, right? These are lines of argument based on inconsequential claims that are intended to cast doubt on the New Testament, but in reality don't actually prove anything. These include things like the mysterious Q gospel, or the order of the books, or, or the different people and events mentioned in the different gospels. And in the end, it's just empty noise that fails to undermine the validity of the New Testament. So stay strong and keep the faith, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and keep praying for Rabbi Singer. Thanks for watching. Shalom.